Happy Sabbath, church. God is good all the time. Amen. Amen. I uh, I'd like to thank the angel of this house, Pastor Ricky, for the invitation to come and not only to come to fellowship with you this morning, but to also minister side by side with a person who I consider a brother, um, Brother Jay Cameron. And uh, I've been staying at the Cameron Hotel for the last, <laughs> it's a five star hotel, I think it's actually six star, I would consider it six star. You have included meals and everything and the views, but i um, been very, very thankful to be there for the last little while. And, uh, and I'm excited to share the Word of God with you this morning. Amen. Before I share the Word of God, I wanted to share a song. And uh, for many of us who've been going through the pandemic, one of the things that we realized that corporate worship is a special thing. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, especially with a lot of churches that have closed their doors, people have been worshiping from, worshiping from homes. And I wrote this song before the pandemic, but it had new meaning after the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And the title of the song is In This Room. So I pray that you're blessed by the words. So while that's happening, I've been a sound guy before, so no worries at all. Not a problem. Um, I just wanted to share that. Uh, I, uh, I have a ministry that I run full-time, a media ministry called Certain Sound Media, and uh, that's one of the auspices under which I, I typically preach, and so if you're into documentaries, especially for kids, uh, as well as Christian music, that's what I'm hoping to produce and to put out there. Um, our big project that we're working on right now, and I'm trying to raise funds and awareness for it, is uh, the Conflict of Ages series. Uh, we want to produce it in high quality 3D animation and release it in theaters. So we solicit your prayers for that. Um, we actually have a company that wants to do it with us, but um, the funding is what we're waiting on. So that is where things are with that. Are we going to get that? Okay, that's still, that's okay. So, uh, as you'll see on the screen, the title is a changed. Um, sometimes you have to call an audible when the Holy Spirit tells you to. How many of you know what an audible is? Okay, that's football lingo, basically. When the quarterback lines up and he sees that the defense is lined up a certain way, he has to change the play. And God told me last night to retitle the sermon, and the, the title of the sermon is Predestined for Greatness. Now I say it. <laughs> but the title of the song is in this room. So, whenever you're ready, let's do it. Okay. Let's do it. We know of this. in this room. 
Father in heaven, as we are about to dive into the word, we invite your presence here, we invite your power here. And I pray that as your presence and your power is here, Father, that, that will make it very clear to the enemy that he has no presence or power here, Father. I pray in a special way that your spirit will just speak to our hearts, move our minds, Lord, my tongue, my lips, my body, dear God, our flesh. But your words are power and spirit, and they can flow through me. So, dear God, speak to me and speak through me, that your people are edified and you are glorified this morning. Because we ask it in Jesus' precious name. <clears throat> Predestined for greatness is the title of the message this morning, and the reason, partially why I use that title of predestined for greatness, in a very personal manner, and it involved taking a trip. I'm from Canada, as uh, my brother shared, and uh, one of the interesting things is that I tend to travel to speak every now and then, and there was a weekend that I was supposed to travel to speak somewhere else in Canada, a place called Vancouver. And as I was getting ready to go for the flight, I'm, I'm pretty good with that. I, I left three hours before so I could get on the road and drive down the highway to get to the airport. And it was an interesting thing because it was a May long weekend, and that's usually the, one of the busiest weekends in Alberta because that's the weekend where we can be free again. Um, pretty much winter, uh, winter lasts about seven months in Alberta. <laughs> seven months. So, so planters, farmers don't plant until May long weekend, right? They don't put seed in the ground because the seed could potentially die. So praise the Lord from Florida. Amen. <laughs> so, just want to say that, right? <laughs> just, just want to say that. So. So as I'm, I'm getting ready to go, I get in my car, I'm driving down the highway, and what takes place is really amazing because there's a lot of rain. And as this rain is falling, a storm develops. And as the storm develops, we, I start seeing cars literally sliding off the road. And everybody starts driving really, really slowly, and I'm like, Lord, I gotta get my flight. And then everybody's slowing down. There was one point, an 18-wheeler, which was just in front of me, and the median was a curve like this. And the 18-wheeler, I stopped, and it kept going, and then it slid sideways right where my Jeep would have been. The Lord literally preserved me on the road, but I said, Lord, i got to get to the airport. So I kicked it into high gear and tried to drive around the cars. Finally got to the airport, right at about the time where my flight was about to take off. And I'm running through the airport, park my car, get to the gate, and I see a whole bunch of people lined up. And I said, hey, my flight hasn't left yet. Can I get on the flight? They're like, sorry, sir. There's like 10 minutes to your flight. And I said, like, yeah, but that should make me, you know, that's enough time to get through security. They're like, sorry, sir, please just stand over here. I was like, sir, I, I, I have a, an important meeting this weekend. I just stand over there. Okay. And I go and I stand in the corner. And as I'm standing there waiting, I'm like, Lord, please do something. Please do something special. And then a line of people are standing there with me. And they say, listen, if you were on this flight, it's, it's not happening. So you can go home. Or you can figure out other options. And so everybody disperses, and that frees up the line. So I go back up to the counter, and the guy's there by himself. And I said, hey, is there anything you can do for me? He's like, no, sir, there's nothing I can do. I'm like, you sure there's nothing? He's like, there's nothing we can Hang on a second. And then he starts tapping the computer. And then as he starts tapping the computer, I'm like, what? What are you seeing? He's like, shh. <laughs> and he keeps tapping. And he keeps tapping away. And then as this man's typing, speed picks up. And he's like, OK. And then he reaches down. And he gives me a ticket, and he says, run to the gate right now. And I'm like, where am I going? He said, just run to the gate. So as I'm running with my bags, I see that the, the ticket doesn't say Vancouver on it. It says to Calgary. And I'm like, but I'm not going to Calgary. Then I look on the back, and it says another ticket going to Calgary. And I'm like, what in the world is going on? So I get in the plane. I fly to Calgary. And as I land in Calgary, I'm there. And I go to the connecting gate. And when I go to the connecting gate, there's not a single person there. And I'm like, Lord, have mercy, what just happened? This guy made a mistake. And as I'm sitting there, the WestJet attendant walks up to me. And he says, are you on this flight? And I'm like, I think so. <laughs> and then he says to me, do you know what just happened? 
And I said, no. And I'm like, I'm trying to fly to Vancouver. What's going on? He's like, yeah, there's a plane that's going to Vancouver. But this plane didn't exist. It was created literally an hour ago when there was a storm because they needed an extra plane in Vancouver. So you're pretty much the only person flying on this flight. And I was like, get out of town. And then he's like, oh no, you're getting out of town, but on a flight. And then that literally happened. I was on the plane, and there was two other ladies who came after me who were also going to Vancouver, and they caught that flight. But God literally created a flight out of nowhere at the moment that I needed it. When you want to talk about predestination, I've seen it personally. But the interesting about thing about this, friends, even more than the idea of predestination, is it taught me something deeper about how God operates. Notice with me. Which comes first, the problem or the solution? When it comes to sin or the plan of salvation, which came first? Solution. The solution came first. When it comes to the tree of life or death, which came first? The tree of life. When it comes to the flood or the way to escape, what came first? <laughs> the, the, the way to escape it, the ark. So it's always solution first, amen? amen? God is not reactive, He is proactive. Amen. He doesn't wait for problems to happen and then figures out, figures out a solution. He sees the future and so He puts solutions in place and waits for the problem. Oh, <laughs> So when that comes to us then, if this is the bigger picture of prophecy, how does that relate to you and I, our own personal problems, brothers and sisters? Does God have the solution for it? Yes, He does. How could God see the future and retain all the answers for Himself? He sees every single problem and therefore He's already put the solution in place. I believe that by faith. It's always solution first with God, friends. I, I, I stop by to let you know that whatever you're struggling with this morning, God has a solution for it. Now, whether we have access to that solution is what we're going to talk about. But God has a solution. Heaven always has a solution, brothers and sisters. And this was a mind-shifting moment for me in my Christian experience. Why is that mind-shifting? And why does that apply to us today? Well, we have a global problem today, amen? We have a global problem that we're all facing, and there's many more problems that are to come. But one of the challenges that we're seeing is that, this is from uh, an article from, from about a year ago, from 2020. And one of the things I noticed was that the World Health Organization chief said, the worst is yet to come. This is not good news, right? But then, after that, Tony Fauci warns Americans that the worst of COVID-19 is still yet to come. And then in Alberta, where I'm from, Teresa Tam says, that's the health director in Alberta. The worst is yet to come. And then finally, in Matthew 24, you read Matthew 24, and what did Jesus say? <laughs> the, worst. the worst is yet to come, right? So I needed that hope and that understanding that no matter what problem I face, I knew God already had a solution in place when I met that problem. Amen? Amen. Amen. For any problem we face, God wants us to know he has the solution. We need to turn to him for it. It's interesting because in the Chinese language, they have words that are composed of different words put together, right? And so some of you may have heard of this before, but they, 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 the, the saying goes that the word for crisis, the Chinese word for crisis, uh, it's, it's ji wei, ji wei, uh, is actually danger mixed with opportunity, right? Danger with opportunity actually means this is a crisis, right? But what's interesting is that it's not exactly true. The, the word opportunity is not the real Chinese word. It's actually danger mixed with a turning point. A crisis is danger mixed with a turning point. And why is that significant, friends? Well, I believe that we were the solution brought into existence for a crisis. You and I were the solution brought into existence for a crisis. What do I, what do I mean by that? The text we read this morning in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 to 30, gives us a preview about the solution that we were supposed to be. In verse 29, it says, And we know all things work to me. Next text. For, we, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, 
then he also called. And whom he called, then he also justified. And whom he justified, then he also glorified. Amen. So what does that mean? God predestined, predestined us into existence for a purpose. And what was that purpose, friends? Well, we know about the war that took place in heaven. And sometimes that war takes place here on earth in a sanctuary. <laughs> when God is fighting with technology. Amen. So why did God predestine humanity? Notice this. We all know about the fall. And it says there, the creation of our world was brought into the councils of heaven. The, there the covering cherub prepared his request that he should be made prince to govern the world then in prospect. This was not accorded him. Jesus Christ was to rule the earthly kingdom under God. He engaged to take the world with all its probabilities. The law of heaven should be the standard law for this new world, for human intelligence. Intelligences. So maybe you didn't know that this was an uh, unpublished quote up until about 2020, 2015. But what she's saying here is that when the discussion about the creation of this world came into existence, Satan said, hey, I want to rule that world. And God said, no, it's not going to be you. It's going to be Jesus. And Satan started to build this animosity for Christ in that moment. Now notice this. It says here, after the fall, angels in heaven mourned the fate of those who had been their companions in happiness and bliss. Their loss was what? Felt in heaven. The Father consulted Jesus in regard to at once carrying out their purpose to make man inhabit the earth. Why? Why, was, why would God, after this crisis, shift to creation? Right? Why would you shift to creation in the midst of a crisis? Notice this. It says here, God created man for his own glory, that after test and trial the human family might become one with the heavenly family. It was God's purpose to repopulate heaven with the human family. That was God's plan for humanity. God's original plan was to be a solution for the loss that was felt in heaven. Can you say amen to that, brothers and sisters? Amen. Amen. God has high aims for you. He brought you into existence as a solution for a heavenly problem. But not only did he bring you into existence for, as a solution for a heavenly problem, he brought you into existence as a solution for an earthly problem as well. Notice this. It says here in Romans chapter 8, verse 29 to 30. As we read, it says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. That phrase is a very interesting uh, phrase. Because when you look at it in the Greek, that word, uh, conformed to the image of his Son, specifically conformed in Greek, the word is actually sumorphos. What does that sound like? Something morphic or changing, right? What? And, and the definition is having the same form as another or similar to, similar or conformed to. So it's here saying that the image that we would have naturally is not an image that is good enough. We need to be conformed to what? To the image of his son. Amen? Amen. Now notice this. The problem is that the image was lost. We know about the, 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 the story about how that happened, but what was it like when the image was functional? When God's image was reflected in the heart and life of Adam, what was it like? Well, we had a demonstration. In Genesis 2.19 it says, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them to Adam to see what he would name them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Now most, most of us, probably when we first read this, just thought, oh, Adam was just naming the animals, right? But do you know the Bible says that God names the stars? Everything he brought into existence, he gave it a what? A name. But what's interesting is it says that God brought them to Adam to what? To see what he would name them. He didn't tell Adam the name. And in a sense, this is, was like a test that God was looking to see if Adam saw things and interpreted things the way that God's mind did as well. So when Adam said, lion, God was like, yes, that's the name. <laughs> Giraffe, that's the name. That's a dog, that's the name. God was extremely overjoyed by the fact 
that Adam was literally giving off the names that God had already given to those animals. That's what it says in the text. It says that was the name thereof. Right? And so God would, 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 would give the name, and the idea is that you could see that the image of God was reflected in Adam because he was literally naming, calling things the way that God would call them himself. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. Now, why is that significant? Well, the challenge is, is that after about three and a half thousand years of sin, that has changed. And when you look in the book of Malachi, you see something else that takes place. It says, ye have worried the Lord with your words, yet ye say, wherein have we wearied him? When ye say, everyone that doeth evil is what? Good in the sight of God, and he delighteth in them. Or where is the God of judgment? What is the text here saying, friends? It's saying that man, after the fall, as a result of many years of sin, can no longer call good, good, or evil, evil. We don't have the same gift that Adam had to be able to understand what is right fully, and we're not usually reflecting that all the time. And, and especially into, you know, driving over here with, um, <laughs> driving over here with Jay and uh, Rosa, one of the things that we were talking about is, we had, there's a, a friend who has a really interesting name, really cute name, it's actually a vegetable. You know, I won't say the person's name. So let's just call it broccoli, right? <laughs> and I thought it was a cute name, you know? But for some reason, the person eventually grew up and said, I don't want to be called that anymore, right? And so all the people that have called her that their entire lives, what are they going to continue to do? Oh, They're going to call her broccoli, right? They're going to try not to, but the natural inclination is to do that, right? And in a similar way, friends, that's what the problem is with sin. We have Our mind has changed. We've lost the mind of Christ. But we've lost the mind of God, and now we have a fleshly, earthly mind. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for us to interpret it, hard for us to place <laughs> a, a title on things the way that God originally had intended us to work. So the question is, why can't it just be repaired? Why can't this image just be fixed? Well, perfect illustration hit me <laughs> as I was preparing this, because that right there is a fancy new laptop. A few months ago, I bought that fancy new laptop. And that, that's not exactly my hand, that's, that's somebody else's hand, but that is my laptop. And the challenge with that is, about two weeks ago, I was jumping in the car, we were going somewhere, and I took my laptop with me to do some work, and then my laptop stopped working. And I was like, Lord, this is a, a, like, a high-end laptop, one of the most powerful ones that can do 3D animation and music production. And just completely stopped working. Like you turn it on, and it just gives you that first icon, that first little like it stays in the, the BIOS basically. For those of you who know what it is, and so I was like, Lord, I spent so much money on this laptop. This laptop needs to work. I, we have to fix this. And so I tried everything, and the laptop was not working. I called customer service, and they're like, Sir, uh, you need to try to fix the um, software, please. And I'm like, No, the software is not the problem. The problem is something else. They're like, you need to follow the instructions to fix the, the, the computer. I was like, okay, fine. So I do all the different things that they say, fix every single thing. I tried everything, nothing works, right? And I call them again. I'm like, okay, can I send it in? Because it's still under warranty. They're like, sir, did you do the instructions? I said, yes, I did everything. They're like, okay, we'll take it. And I was like, thank you. And then I finally got to talk to somebody else and I explained to them the, 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 the understanding that the problem was not the software. I backed up the entire hard drive. The problem was not the software, the problem was what? Hardware. It was the hardware. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> the problem was not the data, the information that was on the computer. It was the hardware itself, right? And so why am I bringing that up? What, what does that mean? I, I want to show you, friends, that this is exactly Paul's problem in Romans chapter 7. Mm -hmm. Romans chapter 7, Paul is saying it's not the software that's the problem. It's this hardware that we have. This flesh, right? This physical nature that we battle with. Look, look at what Paul says here. He says, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth what? No, no, no. no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would do, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Right? This is Paul, he's a converted person. And he's like, I do the evil. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more that I, excuse me, no more I that sit, that do it, 
but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would be good, evil is present with me. Right? This is the struggle, and all have all of us experience this struggle as Christians. You want to do the right thing, but at the same time, your body doesn't want to do it. You go to the store, you see that Twinkie, and you're just like, Lord Jesus, I'm going to walk away from that Twinkie. I'm walking away from why is my body going to this Twinkie? Right? Or, 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 or as, as is illustrated, you know, a few weeks ago, I was, we were at the house eating, and I was, it's really funny, because I said, you know, I'm gonna, I think I want to, um, I think Florida's beautiful, but I think I want to go visit Miami, mm -hmm. you know? And the lovely Buffy was there. And Buffy says, no, you can't go there, Nico. And I was like, w why not? She's like, because of the flesh. And I was like, look, I don't know what's there. What's, what's going to happen? And she basically encouraged me, don't go to Miami. And I said, okay, I heard about spring break. I'm not going to Miami right now. And I didn't go to Miami, praise the Lord, all right? <laughs> but the idea was that she was concerned with the idea of the flesh, right? This thing that we all struggle with. But going on, look what Paul says. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me for what? From this body of death. This is a sad experience, right, brothers and sisters? Amen. And here's the question. Paul is a converted person. So is this picture a picture of the restored image of God? Is Paul supposed to stay like that for eternity? No, no, no. no brothers and sisters. That is Paul in the process of sanctification, amen? He's in the process of sanctification, but do we end up there? No, friends. There needs to be a higher step that God takes us to, amen? So that we can be free from this condition, right? No. Paul goes on to say this. He says in the next chapter, he says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for what? The adoption, the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. So even though I'm a converted Christian, and I'm on the path towards, I mean, who's more converted than Paul? Right? I mean, think about this. This guy prayed to have his, 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 his eyesight fixed, right? But you know, you know what's interesting about that? The Bible says he only prayed three times. If I stub my toe, I pray for like 10, 10 times in the next 10 seconds. <laughs> Lord, please stop the pain. Right? How many, how long have you prayed for God to fix a problem for you? He prayed three times and he knew God meant no. He says, thrice I prayed. That was his connection with God. Amen? Paul knew after the third one, okay, God didn't want me to have it. 